What's up, Iman? How are you? Oh, I'm very good. Very good. It's warm as hell here. Same. <laughs> you got uh, Where are you based? Is it uh, you're based in Miami? Yeah, for now. I'll be back in New York City okay. really soon. Yeah, we got that. We got the Miami weather over here for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, your name is Iman Kawa, right? Yes, that's correct. Is that how you, that's how you pronounce it? Iman Kawa. Yeah. Good. Cuz yeah, what's your what's your background? My parents are from Jordan. Awesome. That's the same, same uh, well, my father is Jordanian. I grew up there. And your mom? So, uh, my mom is Dutch, and now I'm based in Amsterdam. Yeah. But I grew up there for most of my life. Like in, in, I lived 16 years in Jordan. I, mean, I was born here, lived 16 years in Jordan, and then came here to study and work, and now it's 10 years later. So. Well, cool. and what did, you, what did you study there in Amsterdam? Amsterdam. So I went to, first I did uh, liberal arts and sciences in Middleburg, which is in the south, um, and I based in was based in politics, media studies, and uh, philosophy. And then I did my master's in Amsterdam television and cross-media cultures. And um, yeah, how about you? What's your uh, culinary background? Did you always want to get into the culinary arts or did you have other ambitions at first? No, no. It was Being a chef was my thing since I was a kid. So I always wanted to be a chef, um, you know, in the Arab culture that's not really held in like such a high regard. So my dad mm -hmm. was like, not having it in the beginning, like yeah. the kind of, you know, reality yeah. about it. Uh, but I was like really focused on, on doing it. So um, he wanted me to go to hospitality school first. So that's what I did, um, hospitality mm. management. And then from there, I went to study culinary arts at the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. Mm. Uh, at the time, the Culinary Institute of America was like the Harvard of cooking schools. It was the best in the nation, period. Um, I still think it's the best curriculum in the nation. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that there are some more maybe competitive schools out there now. Um, but at the time I was there, it was definitely by far the best. So mm -hmm. I did. So, I mean, the short answer to your question is I've always wanted to be a chef. Yes, that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had the, so you always uh, even before before when you were a kid you were just interested in, in cooking and mm -hmm. or you would watch your mom do it and everything. No, I actually um, I actually watched it on TV. Emeril Lagasse was oh. my main yeah. Emeril Lagasse was like my main inspiration, I guess you could say, or like the person that I wanted to be like the most. Um, and then um, yeah, I really wanted to be on on Food Network actually when I was growing up. That was your ambition. That's why is is that why you picked up the camera in the end when uh, you started honing your skills and you know actually take me back to what what was your first um your, your first job in this field? Okay, my first job was at a place called Barbelud. So it's a, it was a French brasserie and it's it's pretty much it was an externship. And um, I worked for an incredible chef. He his name is mm -hmm. Damien Sansonetti and. Um, you know, you start off on the charcuterie station where you don't really do anything except like set up a station, like everything's already prepared. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is like serve it to the customer. So you're like, it's set the, like table. the intro. It's like the intro to cooking kind of thing. Um, and mm -hmm. then once you prove yourself and that you have enough skills, you go down to garmage, which is like the cold side of the kitchen. And, you know, you prepare salads and all the cold dishes that we offer so soup and salad. Uh, mm -hmm. But you got to remember, like, out of a French restaurant where, you know, the level of dining is, you know, the, the flagship of this particular restaurant group, right? So the Dynex group, yeah. the flagship restaurant is a three Michelin star at the time that I'm there. So the level of cuisine in this restaurant is just like so above and beyond. So like a salad has like seven or eight items, even though it's a brasserie and it's supposed to be more straightforward, a salad has mm -hmm. eight or nine items and you have to plate that within 30 seconds, get it out. And like, you have tickets on tickets on tickets. So, um, it was pretty overwhelming. It was super exciting. It was such a good, like foundation, you know, but the mm -hmm. first one was, you know, my entire career actually was New York city. So New York city at Barbalude was the first kitchen. It's so New York. New York has a lot of Michelin star restaurants. It is packed, isn't it? So for me, like I, I love cooking. I love to do it, but I mean, I couldn't imagine being in such a stressful situation, like, and trying to put all that great food out for other people, right? And not enjoy it myself, you know. <laughs> and how was it uh, for you? What do you love the most about it? 
Um, I feel there's two things. I, I love the reaction of the person that you're cooking for at the end when they're just so happy mm. and satisfied and they feel good. Like that's just, it's a very good feeling for me too, um, yeah. that they're pleased. And, um, I also feel like while I'm cooking, I'm very connected to what I'm doing. And I think that that's my, my, it used to be the reaction of the person. And now my favorite part is the feeling while I cook that connection to food, that, that almost connection to God, I feel. Mm. So I'm a divine, divine uh, experience then. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell me, so you started with, uh, well, salty foods and normal, normal foods, and then you moved into baking. Mm -hmm. And uh, when did that become your passion? Because it seems like you're now really focused on that side. And then you set up the better than your mother brand right so or better than your mother's better no. than your mother's yeah so essentially mm -hmm. what it was is like i've always taken an interest in the entire kitchen not just cooking right cooking is where mm -hmm. my heart is at it's my favorite part of the kitchen it's a part that i would say like that i trained in for my entire career um and you know the tough girls did that side of the kitchen so that's the side of the kitchen that i wanted to be on um mm -hmm. but really mostly it's where my heart was like it's it's what i really liked since i was a kid but I've always taken affinity to pastry. Like I love, I love sweets to eat to begin with. Um, but like, I, I just wanted to always be like a complete cook, a complete chef. So I would, I would in my very first kitchen, instead of going back home for the three week vacation between the externship and school, I asked the pastry chef if I could just work for her for free. So I, I would learn. So it started right. there and then literally in every single kitchen I ever worked in, I would do the same thing. So um, I would just, you know, if they needed help or sometimes, you know, like the, the restaurants would cut your hours if you were like lower on the totem pole. And like, you know, the higher you get in terms of prestige of a restaurant, the lower they're going to make you start if you don't have a lot of experience. So I started yeah. at the bottom quite a few times in, you know, the three mission star restaurants and like the big, the big names and stuff. So sometimes you when you're lower on the the totem pole they cut your hours whatever it may be so i would be i would ask the pastry chef like oh can i work for you since you know like i have only four days this week or whatever mm -hmm. so and then i learned from like all the best chefs in in new york city not the same way a pastry chef or pastry cook would learn right so like, like tempering chocolate for example something i have to like watch on youtube and like call my chef and ask a bunch of questions i don't have i don't have that like background that I've done it a million times where like I can sear a steak and or you know like cook fish and I've done that a million mm -hmm. times and I can do that with my eyes closed better than your mother's as a cookie brand was actually something that I I started as a cooking show on YouTube so the goal was mm -hmm. to teach you how to make whatever better than your mother's because your mom okay yeah because your mom yeah. is, is generally not the average home cook i'm sorry she is the average home cook she's generally not like a fine dining chef with all these skills so the goal yeah. was to you know and teach you what i've learned in the kitchen and the little things that your mom makes at home to make them better right okay that quickly evolved into uh a piece that i did for charity called and the charity is called cookies for kids cancer so yes i saw that yeah 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 so um i used to post the cookies this started like two years ago and so i posted the cookies on my instagram and people went nuts they were like oh my god sell do you sell them do you sell them can we buy them and i didn't want to sell them i was just like no i'm not a pastry chef like i don't want to get known for that and then a friend mm -hmm. of mine was just kind of like yeah, that's really dumb like you have the, like ten thousand <laughs> followers you know, people want your product. Like, why would people are throwing money at you? Yeah, like, why wouldn't you just you should take the it. open door? And then the rest is history. So, like, I was like, cool, okay, fine. If I'm gonna do it, then I'm gonna be the best at it, right? And I'm gonna create this right. entire experience. And I want it to be like as fine dining as possible because that's my background. And then, mm -hmm. boom, shakalaka. There we go. Here we are. Yeah, they look amazing. And then uh, what I find very unique, and it's something that uh, I mean everyone should do in branding is the way reaching out to all these celebrities and how to make contacts and network with all these different people to promote your brand. Mm -hmm. How did that start out? Like how did, what was your first one you think that really made things boom? The first person that shared your post and believe it or not. And how do you go about that as a strategy? So my brothers are, um, sports agents. They're the best, um, 
in their field, I feel, you know, obviously they're my brothers, mm, mm, um, mm. but so yeah. they, they represent UFC fighters and NFL football yeah. players. And so, um, of course, being the sister and like living in New York, whenever there's anything going on there, you know, I'm, I would meet them and accommodate them in whatever way. Like I've cooked for a lot of the guys, mm -hmm. like especially during fight week and stuff like that. So um, Mike Perry and I had already like met and, you know, because like I'm very cool with everybody. Like I love all of their fighters are like family to them. They're like family to the whole family. So we were very cool and just nothing. He was, Mike likes to, if you follow him closely, you know, anytime he's cutting weight for a fight, the entire week of fight week, all he'll post about is food because, you know, like all, all that's on his mind. All the cravings. So I post yeah. a cookie and he freaked out. And he, that was actually the first person to like make it go crazy. Like that's the first person that people were like, oh my God, do you sell them? Do you sell them? Et cetera. And mm -hmm. so um, Mike Perry, I would say, was the very first person. He reposted a cookie just because he liked the way that it looked. And, you know, he was hungry because of fight week and whatever. And then, um, you know, after that, I met a celebrity stylist who just l fell in love with my brand and wanted to gift mm -hmm. it to all of her clients. So she dealt, deals with, she still does deal with the biggest names in Latin music. And so, you know, whenever mm -hmm. there's a set or whatever, just as like a, a refined touch, she would uh, buy my box and, and give it to the, the artist. So, you know, obviously we, we're very close. We built a very good relationship. And so she would be like, you know, take a photo or whatever it may be. Even the artists actually themselves would be like, do you want a picture? Like, you know, they would, they would get equally excited about the cookies as I was getting excited to, to meet them. So um, it kind of just, I feel like when you develop an incredible brand, so having a network is important, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine started because, you know, I met the best, one of the best chefs in my industry period who helped, who, his name is Adam Perry Ling, and he guided me throughout my entire career and gave me all the best mm -hmm. advice in terms of where to work, what to do next, um, and to, you know, how to keep pushing and keep your head down and all these really important things as a cook. He, in the, yeah. in the fine dining world, is such a big name and so important. So if I needed to get in the door anywhere, it was a done deal. So I built my network of incredible chefs by working very hard and being very good in the kitchen. And if not very good, because I won't lie to you and say I was the best and I beat everybody around me. I don't have that kind of story, but I could outwork anyone around me. I was the one asking to stay 17 hours a day. I was the, ask I was the one asking mm -hmm. not to have a day off. All I want to do is work. All I want to do is work. So it started building an incredible network in the kitchen, understanding what an amazing product is. And then, you know, talking to your friends that know people. Um, so, but yeah. like the way we blew off in a, a, I'm sorry, blew up in a big way is literally like, you know, me and Norma getting to know each other and her really loving the brand and like wanting to support it and introducing me to all the right people. And then, so that's the stylist. Yeah. Norma. And then, right. And then, you know, like all of my brother's fighters being incredibly supportive. I would, mm -hmm. I would probably credit, you know, Jorge Masvidal the most because he mm -hmm. not only like loved the brand, like as much as he did, as much as he does. Um, but he was like in my launch commercial, he, he posts every time, like every, anytime, you know, he got a box of cookies, he would post about it. Like he would use, you know, a box of cookies for big fight news. Like there's just so much love on yeah. that end and like so much support from him. So, you know, I wouldn't say it was one person in particular, but there definitely have been key players in the success of the brand. Yeah. Oh, that's the thing. When you uh, do things so so selflessly and you're just giving things away, people are willing to give it back. And um, I think, yeah, also you, it seems like just uh, as long as you have a great, great product, like people are just automatically going to want to shout it out. Right. It, you know, there's no real shortcuts when it comes to that. I mean, um, so what was, uh, you said that, like at the Michelin restaurants, you just outwork everyone so how was yeah how was that experience for you as in, in terms of like the amount of pressure wait hold on Sorry. God forbid <laughs> yeah. this ever goes viral one day i don't want someone who i didn't say outwork everyone i said i was willing to outwork everyone so, to and outwork. and but that's the thing about <laughs> potentially i work everyone that's the that's the thing about a mission rated restaurant everybody is willing to outwork everybody else mm. everyone is dying to be the best not everybody but 90 90 percent of the people in the kitchen that's what they came there for at least in the time that yeah. i was cooking so like there's a lot of chefs who decide us now the generations that have changed you know like they're more about the limelight that comes with cooking so like 
I, I want to say that I'm caught somewhere in the middle of the two. So there is a generation who strictly does it for the praise and the like. Yeah. Does it work? Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right. Good. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. So um, we're, we're discussing, you know, being in, in the kitchen and being willing to outwork everybody else. And uh, just that competition level over there. It's, you know, you have to be better than the best, period. And that's something I've said in like, mm. you know, several different podcasts. Like you grow up in an environment that it's like, if you're not constantly willing to uh, exceed your your expectations, your chefs. I had a chef, he was so amazing. Adam, Chef Adam would say, don't do your best, do my best. Knowing that his best is so out of reach for a young cook because he's so skilled, he's so talented, he's been doing it for so long that like a young cook is never gonna do his best. His best is elite, but that's mm -hmm. the goal. That's the like shoot for the moon type of goal. Yes. So, you know, um, essentially you you know you you touched on i wasn't the best but i was willing to outwork anybody yeah absolutely because, right so there's a you know a bit discussions in the world right about talent versus skill and talents you're not mm -hmm. born with and skills you you gain through self-discipline you gain through practice so yeah. i would like to say that I, i'm naturally talented in the kitchen definitely there's really not a lot that i cannot do and execute very successfully um but people who come into an industry where you're making 725 an hour to start are not they're either more talented than you are or more disciplined than you are when you get there and mm. in order to rise above and be the best you either have to you don't you can't talent is natural to your like you're born with it so you're not going to increase yeah, yeah, your yeah. talent, but you can absolutely increase your skill. And so unless you're yeah. like after 12 hours a day going home and cutting fine, you know, a fine dice or a brunoir, you're not going to, you're just not going to be Adam Perry Lane. You're not going to be Jean-Francois. And to maybe the people in Amsterdam, they're not sure who these people are, but you Google them and you'll understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Right. So you think it's it's also a twenty four seven thing? You'd go home and you'd still hone your skills and still work on it. I wouldn't say it's a twenty four despite... seven thing, but it, it has to be obsessive at least for uh, you know enough time for your body to understand. You need to be able to do it with your eyes closed in order to mm -hmm. have mastered what we're doing as cooks. So I think there's a few things here. Um, you. I don't think everything is 24 seven. I think that there does have to be balance in your life, but I think that as you are becoming excellent, um, mm -hmm. you do have to train rigorously. And this is nothing like, I'm not saying anything profound. Um, cooking is an art, it's a craft and it's a skill. And so to hone your craft, you have to be, you know, like consistent, you have to be disciplined. You have to keep going. Like every day has to be the same thing. You know, like, and, and essentially that's what cooking is. It's, it's writing a story using different words every day. That's what cooking is. Hmm. So you're, that's a nice way to put it. You know, you're cutting, it's cutting vegetables consistently. So that way, when you cook them, they all cook at the same rate. It's, yeah. you know, making like a medium rare is a medium rare. It, it falls between a, a, a specific temperature and it's cooking those you know, steaks every time perfectly under high pressure, getting it in the window within those five minutes, whatever it may be. It's that's what it is. It's not about being 24 seven. It's yeah. about being disciplined. It's about being rigorous in your training and doing it enough and setting the foundation to then after that, being able to like enjoy balance, enjoying like the with my eyes closed type of thing. But like mm -hmm, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll hear anybody who's successful and they'll tell you like for five years, for 10 years, all I did was X. All I did was Y, like LeBron James, you know, for example, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so many people's idol. And like, to be honest with you, for a long time, I didn't like, I'm not a basketball fan. Let me not say yeah. I'm not a basketball fan. I'm not into basketball the same way I am into football and UFC, right? Like if it's on, mm -hmm. I can't lie and say I would watch it, but whatever, right? Like it's, I know that's yeah, yeah, yeah. a good sport. I feel you have the same and the same with it. Yeah. So many, so many people idolize LeBron James. And so I was, um, 
not in the same category in terms of like holding him to, I just knew like this man was amazing. He was brilliant. Like he was the best at what he did. So I started watching things about him. Like, you know, me, like everybody else, sometimes I need a little motivation. Um, yeah, of course. And so I looked, I was like, you know what? Let me look at some LeBron James stuff. And you know, his biggest, his, his biggest thing was talking about how, you know, his hand wasn't big enough to palm a ball. Like a lot of basketball players are naturally. I didn't know that. And so what he did was practice that over and over and over again. And there were, there was a specific game where, you know, there was someone else, you know, showing out in the league and, and, and he was a big deal. And LeBron mm-hmm. had incredible back spasms in, in that like two days leading up to the game and the day of, and, you know, he didn't want to play that game and he talks about telling himself that like you know the way it's going to go down in history is you were afraid of this other basketball player and Uh that's not you so you're going to get over it and you're going to push through the spasms and today's not the day you get to rest so it's like unless you have that mentality literally for anything you do whether it's cooking or Mm -hmm. anything you know the the rate of success is small so Gary V, he's another like really big influential motivational yes, speaker. I'm, in I'm big on him too, for sure. And he discusses how so many millennials have like million dollar dreams, at, but not enough work ethic to put behind it. And mm-hmm. um, I will say like one thing I pride myself is it, on is my work ethic in, in the time that I was in the kitchen. And even now, like when I'm motivated or there's a, there's a, a fire under me, there's really nothing that can so I work. I'll work till, you know, like I'll work 24 hours if my body will let me. Like I'll do, yeah. I'll, I'll push to my max for the result. And and if, if that's your you. mindset, sorry. Yeah, what what I also meant with the 24-7 thing was also that it's not necessarily that you have to hone your craft to work on it for 24 or 7, but more that it becomes such a part of your identity that you automatically start doing it. As I'm feeling right now with my own brand as well. It's like um, you... Always have that in the back of your mind. Uh, you're always doing things along the way, even in your personal life or the context you make that sort of can help you out as well. And in a way that your brand can help them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think I feel uh, like that's what you're getting at. Mm. I, I also though, like, and I don't know that this sounds like amazing, but I don't really want to be identified only as better than your mother's, right? Like, I think that it's important for people mm-hmm. to understand that your identity is very separate from your brand. Right. Like it should. Yeah. It's there's they're they're one in this. They're synonymous when it is in discussion of better than your mother's. There shouldn't be discussion of it without Iman Kawa because I built that brand. Right. But when there's yes. discussion and like this is it's it's difficult to like get across what I'm about to try to say. With, in discussion of Iman Kawa, better than your mother's should be a smaller part of the whole. Like I you said, you know, identifying with your brand. And I think it's really important to make clear at least my my views on identity and i think that like being a chef is only one piece of a a very bigger picture Mm -hmm. person that i am and i think the mistake a lot of people make is doing that because then what happens if better than your mother's doesn't succeed or what happens because success is fleeting. that's a good point success is fleeting right like you can be on this incredible high Fine dining was was a force to be reckoned with for so many years. And now after COVID-19, every single one of my chefs is suffering. And it's it's like, wow, that's insane to have been the girl who looks up to you. And now I'm going to come and help you, you know, figure out what to do next because I, I thought of it Definitely. before. So it's like, if you only identify with your brand in, in, in a moment's notice, your entire life will be shattered. So I think... Mm-hmm. It's specific and it's very important the way that we think of success, the way that we think of what 24 seven means. And like, yes, identify into a way of like, I made that and I'm proud of it and I love it. But if you become so associated, not by the public, but by your own mind, if you become so associated with what you've built, your ego is so attached that it's easily like you're easily breakable. So you know, I, I wanted to make that clear there. You're like, you know, in that, like you identify with your brand, et cetera. I just wanted to kind of like yeah. throw that out there. Yeah, it makes sense. No, it's a good, uh, it's a good tip because I think also a lot, of, a lot of people would struggle with it and they become their brand. Right. And that is, again, something different. 
Um, and it's good to be versatile. I mean, people are born with all these different skills, and why just ho- why just you know work or perfect one of them if you can have you know so many other things you can do. So how's that for you? Like, what what other things are you looking forward to setting up? And you seem really busy, especially during COVID times. Yeah. Um. So I I got lucky to have started off as e-commerce, you know, and it seems like that's essentially mm-hmm. the way of the world. Um. People were already looking for convenience with, you know, Uber Eats and um, DoorDash and all the delivery apps and stuff. So people were already looking for convenience. Um, But now COVID-19, I feel like, gives an element of safety for whatever reason, like direct to consumer. So I I Hmm. was able to maintain and actually probably triple my sales during COVID-19. Um, just for the simple fact that people want online. So, you know, people were graduating, people were, there was Mother's Day. There was so many things that like a box of luxury cookies is so fitting for. So maybe where you would have gone and bought something else at the mall, now you can't, you know, people were like, well, okay, I'm going to give this brand a try. And, you know, just, it's sometimes it's written for you that way, as long as you just hold on. So like it was already doing well before COVID-19 because of like all the influencer marketing and just really, you know, like, pushing as hard as I have. Um, but COVID-19 really did, did help in terms of like more mass, um, audience, like people Mm. who just heard of it through someone else, not through a celebrity. Yeah. Because your, your world is the online and that's the one that actually grew right when the normal or the real world sort of stopped. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. And where do you think this, do you think you're, uh, did you get a very more traditional Arabic upbringing as well? Or so, I, I don't know how, um, I feel like yes and no. The answer to that is yes and no. So mm-hmm. like I was not allowed to like have a boyfriend until I was, you know, graduated college kind of thing. And your boyfriend has to mm-hmm. marry you. And like, you know, yeah. you have to marry an Arab <laughs> and like um, you can't yeah. wear your hair down to school and you can't wear makeup and you can't talk to boys. You know, like there was that very <laughs> like conservative, very strict upbringing. Um, a lot of like, you know, what would they say about Ibrahim Kawa's daughter kind of thing, you know? Definitely, um, yes. <laughs> traditional in that, you know, all the family was always together. There was, you know, on holidays, my father was the oldest of his his siblings. So on holidays, like, everyone was at our house, you know, like those, mm-hmm. like, beautiful, I, I love that. the yeah. hospitality of the culture where it was like, your uncle is here, make sure you serve him and he feels really, like, welcome. You know, the beautiful mm-hmm. parts of my culture and the upbringing, I would say that I did get, but we were raised in America. So, and we were raised in yeah. Miami, more than, more than America, Miami, and Miami doesn't have other Arabs. So, you know, oh, okay, like, yeah. that, that I think I has a, a big role to play though, because if the people around you don't know your culture or don't share in it, it's very difficult to, to like thrive in the culture, to understand it completely. So like Arabic yeah. was spoken in the household, but it was not the primary language. It was English. Or like our parents would mm-hmm. speak to us in Arabic and we would respond in English, right? So I took an Arabic class in college because I was, it was very important to me to learn the language. And then once I moved to New York City, that's when I really learned our culture, if I could be completely honest. I was not, and like, so on top of that, we're Arab Christian, right? So like, there's a very small yeah. person. Hey, same, by the way. Sorry? In my case, it's same, same with me, oh, actually, cool. by the way. I didn't know there was that many of us. But, yeah. There's not, but there's world. not so many of there's us, not. right? So like, yeah. Essentially, there's like a subculture to being Arab. Like if you're Arab Christian, Mm -hmm. you're kind of one way and have to behave a certain way. And I feel like our moms and dads held us to an incredibly rigorous standard because we're Christian. Mm -hmm. And in the Middle East, by default, if you're a Christian girl, I can sleep with you. I can. Absolutely. There's, I know. And like, look, people don't talk about it, but like, I'm, I don't care. Like, I'm going to say. No, that's good. Let's get into it. Cause I really want to talk about this. Great. I want to bring it out there. So, yeah, cool. So essentially, you you know, like I feel like we're held to two different standards. And like, you know, it's funny because, and let me be very clear. I love everybody. I don't care who you pray to. I don't care what you believe in. There's Mm -hmm. no, there's like, I don't believe in being separate because you, pray to Allah. And I, I, I believe in Jesus. Like that to me doesn't mm-hmm. exist. So when I, when I discuss Islam and Christianity, I want to be very clear that I'm discussing my experiences with the two. Okay. With, and, and being mm-hmm. an Arab woman in, in America and then being exposed to 
like the the culture. So Arab culture at its mm. root is Islamic, and we agree there. Yes. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But there are many of us that are, or a small percentage of us that are Christians, because in the Middle East they are treated like I I I haven't experienced or know this, but I was told that Muslims won't support Christian businesses. So it's very difficult to be a Christian. There have been some, yeah, there have been some cases. Like I can tell you about it if you have questions. Um, is that is, is that the case? Like where it's like, oh, don't don't even open a, a business if you're Christian, you're not going to succeed. In the middle, like no, Jordan, for example, in a way. So I can speak for for Jordan. Um, they the Muslims do will support Muslim businesses more than than Christian businesses. And my father, but this is back in the day. So this is when my father was younger, around my age. Um, he was uh, denied promotions because he was a Christian and then people that were working way less, uh, the results were just terrible, would still get promoted over him because he was a Christian. So, you know, so, it, so. It, it, that's so sad. Like that, that to me is just like yeah. so backward. But I can tell you, it is definitely changing a lot very quickly there. Well, that's you know, OK. Thank God. You know, like, um, yeah, so. Yeah. So did you have the traditional Arab upbringing, right? Yes, in that my dad tried his best to stay true to the roots and keep the, the like, purity of, of his daughters and, like, the, you know, you have to wait until you're married and the, like, really, like, old school, you know, be a good girl kind of thing. And, like, we don't, you know, my brothers were allowed to do whatever they wanted, right? I mean, there mm. were rules, too, but, like, in, in comparison, my brothers, you know, could stay out and have girlfriends and do their thing very very yeah, yeah. Arab where the girls were not allowed you know mm -hmm. um so anyway my mom was very specific about you know not having muslim male friends you can have a muslim female friend but not a male friend and so yeah. i think it's normal that most of us most christians or muslims fall in love in in, in both religions right yeah. And I was warned that Muslims sleep with Christian girls because they want to keep the virginity of a Muslim girl. So to be very careful, I've... Allegedly, that happens. Oh, it does. It does. <laughs> I'll say allegedly. <laughs> it's not alleged. It does. And, I, yeah. and, I'll, and I'll say why. I actually don't care to, like, express it. So my, you know, no, I, I fell for someone. I was, like, so in love with the guy. This is going off on a tangent. I don't know actually if we should get into this this part, but essentially, it's a, that's not a that's it's not a legend. Like I do think that that really does happen, and I think um, being in New York City and experiencing people who had parents who raised them in a in a way of uh, being very old school, where it's like there's no way like I would marry outside of my religion, or they're very mm -hmm. judgmental of you. So like I was living on my own in New York City at like like with the other female roommate at like 23 years old. And so when I really liked this guy, he was like, well, like I can't bring you home to my parents. You know, you live by yourself. You don't live with your parents. Wow. You, uh, you know, like it was this very old school, a very yeah. backwards way of thinking. And it was just like, you know, what is traditional? I, I should have started the answer with define what a traditional Arab upbringing is. Because that, yeah, I would that say culture shock to me. I was like, "What? Yeah, like we're in America. What do you mean?" <laughs> it's funny how you know a lot of uh, people uh, well, who have Arabic parents that are born and raised in other countries tend to be extra proud and extra yes. um, hold on to these Arabic traditions. Right, agreed. And I feel extra Arabic when I'm here in the Netherlands <laughs> because of that as well. Because I'm different. <laughs> than them and i relate more to arabs and my behavior is more arabic right. you know um so when you say my behavior is but yeah, more so, arabic mm -hmm, yeah so what does that yeah. mean for you so the humor um the more i think my work ethic is very arabic my entrepreneurial spirit is more arabic like so if if you look at uh, the way business is done here in the west or in the west or I don't know, in Europe, people are very much into, okay, here's what I want from you, uh, blah, blah, blah. There's no personal relationship. This is just a business relationship. You're a tool for me to get where I want, you know? Right. And um, when it comes to the Arabic, I really am very personable. 
uh, you become friends with the person first, you become social, and then you consider doing business. Right. You know, so I'm, I'm, and that also translates to social. I'm the same way in terms that I like definitely have to connect with someone. I have to like you to want to like work yeah. and do things with you for you, whatever it may be. And I, I definitely prefer genuine relationships. I will also tell you this, hearing that like, hey, this is what we need to get done. And I just want to do this and keep it moving. There's there. I sometimes because unfortunately people are not as pure at heart as some of us are. It would be easier mm -hmm. if everyone was just like, these are my intentions. Yeah, right. And straightforward and like, let's just do business. This is how it is. Mm -hmm. This is what I need. You know what I mean? Like there's. Yeah, both of them have their benefits. Say again. Both of them have their benefits, yeah. of course. But uh, I'll, I'll say I took after my father because I always grew up with him. He, uh, he was always on the phone and he always brought guests back for, for work and from other countries and was hosting them and stuff. And, you know, that was just natural for me. Right. Because that was what I grew up seeing. And that's very Arabic. And I was shocked when it wasn't the same here. I'm like, really? You're, you're being a robot right now? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm trying to connect it, with you. Yeah. People think you're weird almost sometimes, right? It's just like, what are you doing? Like, what are your... Like, you yeah, it's like, don't you have friends? <laughs> I think I, I, I will say about it. I, I, that's my favorite part about our culture. And I was just saying that. I was just discussing that recently. Like, the hospitality part of our culture is probably by far the best. There is no, there is nothing in comparison to Middle yeah. Eastern hospitality, period. Literally, like, there's just nothing that compares, I feel. No, um, no, yeah, for sure. We are so about making people feel comfortable and, like, incredible in the home or just in general. And that's why I think, like, for an Arab, it, it's, it's such a double-edged sword. Like... Arabs, unfortunately, see the hospitality industry for people, cooks in general, for people who are uneducated, for people who couldn't do something better with themselves. Like I had so much pushback from my mom's aunts who are super, super Arab in the way that they think. And they were like, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're so pretty. There's so many other things you could do. You're so smart. Why are you wasting your life on this? And I said, but this mm -hmm. is what I want to do. This is from my heart. Um, and it's a double edged sword, I feel, because we are so hospitable, but look so down on that particular industry and Arabs don't realize that like yeah. they did it. And, but with a spirit of, we're going to do this at the best level we could, there's no one who competes with us in, in terms of mm -hmm. hospitality. So like if you took yeah. a French restaurant and you had an Arab consultant on terms of the experience to the guests. Ooh. I just think that, yeah. that be, like, <laughs> I just, I just gave someone another multi-million dollar idea. Hire me as the Arab company. consultant though. Hey, jump on it yourself. Like you should do that. Manage a French restaurant. No, I, think, yeah. well, I, I'm a little bit busy managing, you know, better than her mothers, but perhaps, you know, yeah. we'll do something like that. <laughs> Inshallah. No, it's, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you were basically sort of trying to, they were trying to push you or your family was trying to push you into in a different direction. Always. And, uh, but maybe that pushback sort of gave you the thick skin and extra sort of work ethic that you have now. I think that's what I was getting at, actually. Now I remember <laughs> for when I asked about your Arabic upbringing is uh, work ethic is a huge thing there because it, it's always been like you either have to, you have to be an engineer or a doctor. You have to get the highest grade. So the work ethic is there. So whether you apply that to, to your education or into any other field, you know, it's beneficial. Is that the same with you? Do you think that helped? Yeah, I think so. I don't think the, the I don't believe like that negativity is like the way I, I'm, I'm really not into like bringing anyone no. down um, because there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who won't take that and like, oh, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm that kind of person. But there's a lot of people who it'll defeat them. So what I do think helped make me better um, was was being one of six kids and noticing that the only way you got my dad's attention was if you were the best at something. Mm -hmm. And my dad instilling in us that we had to be the best at something. So I've, I've discussed this many times and I tell the story of my first time bringing home a C. So my dad was exactly like you said, you had to be the best and bring home the best grades and et cetera, et cetera. So I thought a C was failing, right? And so I got a C. Well, Same. Like, yeah, final grade. I agree. Say again. I agree. Is that that's how I had it too. So when when my final grade in a class when I was like fifth grade or something, right, was a C, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> I fucking failed. Final I'm not gonna grade. get to middle school. 
Oh my God. <laughs> like I was freaking out. So I asked the lady in the office, uh -huh. do I have to take summer school? Like, how do I like, like, you know, like, will I go to middle school? Like I, I'm freaking out. Like I'm yeah, yeah. on my dad when I get home. She's like, C is not failing. C is average. And I was like, oh, I'm good. Great. So I go, I'm a normal oh. human. <laughs> I like, Baba, I didn't fail. Look, she said that it's average. And it's just really funny. Like, you know, if you think about it in retrospect, like I was up until the age of 10 years old, I thought C was a failing grade. That's how rigorous mm -hmm. the like standards were in the house, right? Like, you had to be the best. So he was like, yeah, my kids are not average. Don't bring me home C's. And it, it is that moment that was so impactful to me that really made me understand mm. like why our parents like demand yeah. this level of excellence from us. Like, you know, you're, you become their pride, you become their this, whatever their intentions are. The impact on me was that you always have to be the best. And my dad was an, an incredible, brilliant man, um, businessman mm -hmm. and brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Br but brilliant advice business. was always in how you were going to take over. How, and not like this like scheme, it was always like, you have to be, if you're working in retail, be the number one in the store. Be the best so that the regional manager notices you, so that you get a promotion yeah. very quickly. So that, like, it was always about being better than everybody around you and being better than yourself, that, than you were the day before. Like, you just had to exceed. And so I think like that That's level, yeah. that, that tone in the house and having a big brother, like my, my brothers who, Maki took that so personally, that's the eldest brother. He took it so personally and was so aggressive about being the best literally at everything. Like he made it to state championships when he wrestled. When he was in retail, he became the manager super, like as quickly as you could be. Like, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Malky started like working at Burger King. You know what I mean? Like during high school. Yeah. That he, wow. seeing someone like that, and he was my, like as a little kid. Was it like from his own will, like he, he decided he wanted to go work there for extra money? right just to work right like he he did exactly what he wanted yeah not that your parents said you have to work exactly my parents were actually the opposite my parents didn't want us to work so we only focused on school oh my god this is so relatable to me I just, <laughs> yeah I like then cool. but yeah then if that's the case then yeah, i guess i got a typical arab upbringing in that case you definitely did i don't think you realized it till now yeah but it's not like, okay, of course, there's many, there's many different ways. Like there's, there's friends of mine that just had also terrible upbringings that they were also Arabic, you know, right. like upbringings. Um, I think we got but the, there's also we got the good really, ways. you know, middle class, like my parents love us and, and they came here to, to make it better for everybody. Yeah. We want to see you succeed kind of upbringing. Yeah. And they don't hold you in an average regard. Like they don't see you as an average. They see right. you as they're their, you're their daughter. You're brilliant. So you have to act exactly. brilliant. So that's what it is. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we had it good. I mean, uh, so, you know, the, there's a, what, what do you think the perception is of, uh, or the misconception is actually about Arab women or for, or in Miami maybe growing up? Because look, I remember um, at least from also my father's time when he, he was in Miami way back in the day before Arabs existed even there, um, everyone was speaking to him in Spanish because they thought he was Mexican. Oh, that's funny. And um, so they weren't used to it. Um, but now there's more of you and us. So do you feel any misconceptions? So, hmm. well, you got to remember, I haven't lived in Miami for a very long time, right? Like, so I'm there now, but. Or in, okay, or in New York. New yeah. York, New York is like little Palestine, little Egypt, mm -hmm. little Yemen, right? Like it is so yeah. saturated with the culture, but with the culture of, of a person who left the blood like 50 years ago. So yeah. it's very backwards. And I have very close friends that were, you know, that are Yemeni that are incredibly oppressed in America. And mm. you asked the, the question is, do you find that there are misconceptions about Arab women? I don't know. That yeah, what are these misconceptions? I, I don't know that there are misconceptions specifically to our gender. Um, mm -hmm. but I definitely think that there are misconceptions to the, the culture, to the race in general. I think that that's the answer to that question, but it, it brings me, <laughs> yeah, okay. I want to discuss like the Arab women in general. I do want to, I do want to point out that I think that they are, um, 
making progress, but very held down in general. I think that, and I think more than most people understand, because I didn't think that that was the thing, but I went to, mm -hmm. there are two separate things I'll talk about. One, a very good friend who is from Yemen, whose culture didn't even allow her, she, first of all, she was forced to get married and have kids at 16 years old, mm -hmm. okay? They pulled her out in America. This is in America. They pulled yeah, her out is, of yeah. school, they pulled her out of school, and um, forced her to get married and have kids. Serve her in-laws in Yemen. She got tired, didn't like it, came back to New York. Oh. She wears a hijab and doesn't like it. Um, she's not allowed to get a job, although she wants to, and her husband can't provide enough for her and her kids. So she wanted That's to like, drive Uber because you know she can set the schedule, she knows how to drive, um, and she doesn't have uh, any sort of degree. Not because she's not smart. The girl is so capable. She's beautiful. She's intelligent. Yeah. It's like there's so much that she has to offer. And because she's afraid of whatever. So she said she was going to drive Uber. And her parents told her that she would shame the family. And what if a Yemeni guy gets in the car? So I think that people don't realize that these are the things that actually still happen today. And that as as women in in that culture i was told by my father i wasn't allowed to be a cook and i was like okay good luck too bad you raised me in america i'm gonna do whatever the fuck i want sorry for the like, yeah yeah you can bleep that out but no you can you just go for it i want it to be raw so so you know the the i was i i, I was there's but i noticed that there most arab girls are not like me so either you're lucky in america to have arab parents so i do think like palestine lebanon jordan where they're Maybe Palestine is not Western. Jordan, Lebanon, right? Where there's mm -hmm. more like Christianity because we're a little more. You know, Lebanon was 70% uh, Christian not so long ago. Say that again. Lebanon used to be 70% Christian not so long ago. I know. I know. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, you know, it, it, it allowed the culture to be more open, more free. And like, I mm -hmm. think people take open and free as like derogatory terms and they're just, they're beautiful terms. They allow you to be you. And they allow you mm -hmm. to, um, they allow growth when there's freedom and you're open as a culture that you allow people to grow. So I think people don't realize that even in America, Arab women are incredibly oppressed. I think as a yeah. culture and a religion, people believe that we are only meant to make babies and support the man. But it's so insane how like there's an equal amount of lazy, incapable men of providing for a family that there mm. are two capable and brilliant, incredible women able to, you know, contribute to society. So I think that um, the first story was about my Yemeni friend. And the second one now is about a dinner that I went to with probably 25 Arab women. It was a gathering for, um, did you ever hear about the little Instagram thing that started April is for Arab food? No. So it was a way that Palestinians... That does sound amazing, though. It, it was. So Palestinians decided to get together and preserve the culture of Palestinian food specifically um, because they felt as though Israel was taking over Ooh. our food or our culture and claiming it as theirs. So much. Yeah. So, you know, all, a, a lot of the, the movements are, I feel, um, rooted in that. But so that's what they were feeling. Yeah. And so their goal was for more Arabs to get involved in the food culture and post all April, celebrate Arab food. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, but this is how it seems to me as how the movement started. Maybe the people who actually started the movement are gonna come for me later, but that's how it just kind of was pitched to me. Regardless, we sat at this table of like 25 women and there were two entrepreneurs, one including myself, of 25 women in America. 25. And it was to some yeah. degree heartbreaking because a lot of them said, I'm just a supporter. I'm, I don't have my own business, but I'm here to support you. So my rhetoric to them, my, like my response was, but, you know, but without you, we don't become who we want to be. So, you know, you guys are equally as important. 
But then after it, all, like so many of them came up to me and were like, I love you, your light and your story. And like, you, you know, that you're not afraid to do what you want to do, etc. Like an example for them. And it, it, which was like so overwhelming for me in such a like beautiful way. And they said, you know, you know, we love what you do, etc., etc. I wish I could have done X. And, 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 and they don't realize that like yeah. you are your own, like you choose whether you do X. We all choose what we end up doing. And I think that because as a culture, we've, we've created a language where women don't get to choose, Arab women are incredibly oppressed. That's the thing. I think there is a lot less of an excuse when you live in the West or in the States and you are from an Arab culture because there you have the, the capabilities or so to, to do it or the, let's say the, the means. Whereas in the Middle East, yeah, I guess it's a lot tougher for these women as well to break out because... The families are everywhere. The threats are there. They'll get threatened. Right. And they'll they they have to escape the country to do it. Right. I love that you're talking about this. I love that we're talking about this because I have a lot of brilliant friends of mine and female friends there that, um, and on both on both sides, like the ones that also believe that, oh, no, I have to be a housewife. And the other ones that are like, no, fuck that. I'm not going to be a housewife. And setting up great businesses and becoming extremely strong women doing brilliant things on their own. And I think everyone has to hear this. I agree. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> I was yeah, really um, big about yeah. like empowering, you know, women specifically for a very long time. Um, just, you know, like in, in my social media and like this was before Better Than Your Mother's. Like I was really big about it mm-hmm. for the fact that like I didn't like that my dad would tell me no about certain things or that I would see that, you know, my brothers got to do whatever and we didn't. Like that used to always get under my skin. Um And so I was really big about empowering women for a very long time. But at the end of the day, like after experiencing life, I think that everybody, like, you know, there are men who feel like depression and anxiety and just the same way, they're just not as expressive. So like as much as I would like to severely and strongly empower women, I hope to do it literally for just anybody who wants to be something in the world. Yeah. I think that's a great, that's a great mindset. That's it. (laughs) Yeah, no, uh, there was a movie, I don't know if you've watched uh, or heard of the Netflix series Jin, which was a Jordanian uh, show, it was the first Jordanian series. Um, now, um, the story for me was, I'm going to have the main actress on, so I won't shit on it too much, but the story was uh, weak to say the least, but I don't think that was their point, because it, it, it focused on a um, a private school from a, from suburban families and kids in the middle class. So they were all partying, you know, they, they, they were doing smoking weed and drinking and all that, uh, having relationships with boys. That garnered such a backlash, but it showed the world the hypocrisy that lives there. And it also showed another issue to me, which is like, because all these actors got death threats on their social media and everything. They had to deactivate the social media for a while to get away from it, you know? Well, and, well um, this, this was set in Jordan. It's set in Jordan. Friends of mine played in it. An artist I managed was cast. Well, we didn't take it because of the script. <laughs> you know, like, so it's all set there. Um, and so a lot of people are, oh, this is brilliant. Because finally, I, a lot of people that grow up like that find something they can find themselves in. Because in, in, traditionally in Arabic films, movies and, and, and shows, uh, they, would, they wouldn't find it relatable. Because this is not how I grew up. I grew up doing this. Right. So that's what they like. They thought it was cool that it showed the world that. And then the other group came and said like, no, this is representing our country so badly because in their mind, in their mind, the West probably thinks the same way about morality as they do. And they don't want to show oh, that this stuff oh happens God, in their favorite, country. My favorite mm. are the Arabs who just came to America. Oh my God. They're the, they're the best yeah. and the worst. Cause they're like, it's a, <laughs> the land of milk and honey, but it's like the, it actually it's, it's sad for those it's sad for those two because they, they go through this like, wait a second. So no one cares if I date a girl who's not my wife? Hold on. <laughs> but hold on, but like the whore, isn't she? Cause she slept with me and we're not married. Isn't she a whore? Shouldn't I care about? Wait. She's texting me. <laughs> wait, hold on, but now but now I'm in love with her because I slept with her. So isn't that love? Like it is so insane yeah 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 meet someone who came from the middle east or like that culture and like gets introduced to western culture and i need to watch that show because i actually have come to realize like arabs want to raise people against human nature in the way of your nature is to be attracted to the opposite sex regardless of how Mm -hmm. okay regardless of how old you are so bold statement 
13 years old, your hormones start. A girl gets her period. You know, yeah. Like you're, you're, mm -hmm. you start being interested in the opposite sex. That's why little kids are boyfriend and girlfriend in, in high school. Do I condone that? No, I do love our culture for preserving our innocence as children because like being, uh, uh, losing your virginity at 16, like you've really, you've, you've lost a lot of being a kid, I feel. Right? Like I, I, that I, I agree. I think that was the most surprising thing I heard about the Netherlands when people are dating at 13, 14. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't know. I don't think you don't know how to like change your underwear yet at fucking 13. Like you shouldn't be dating. In my, <laughs> my personal opinion, you're a kid. Be a kid. Like go play outside. Do the things that we used to do as children. Right? So that part I do yeah. appreciate about the Middle East. But, you know, the rest of it is very against what a human does by nature. We... We want to explore as human beings. People want to smoke weed if it makes you feel a type mm -hmm. of way. People want to drink mm -hmm. alcohol. It is there. It's accessible to you. They, you want to explore. You want to experience. It's just what life is like for everybody. So being in the Middle East and saying that kids don't do this, you're like fucking out of your mind. You as a parent probably did it too. Yeah. There's like, who are you lying to? Even of our parents. Like my mom, I will say is like a saint she's the virgin mary reincarnated all our moms are saints i write all our moms <laughs> but like she really said like i've never been drunk my first sip of wine was at my wedding you know i've only ever dated your dad like those little things you know were true to her but not my dad my dad was the opposite my dad was super like out there and whatever so it's like <laughs> making it shameful to be a human as we are to our like core and our nature is what i feel our culture does it, yeah, it's it it's very strange, sense. and especially for me. Also, when it comes to music, it doesn't. It totally doesn't make sense when it comes to music because you're listening to something and it makes you shake your ass. <laughs> like it, it's like this right. is what it does. Right. This is I like this song. Right. So, uh, but then you're not allowed to listen to it, which is strange. And you know that the person who's telling you not to listen to it listens to it secretly. Exactly, and you know what's amazing? It makes you feel a certain way. My, that's so good. Mm. My uncle like recently heard a song where it talks about like. She's a, the girl being as like sweet as cream or something like that. And it got like banned in the mm. Middle East. And he oh. was like going on and on about this song mm. when he first like mm. introduced it to us. And, and he was like, do you hear it, Amo? The crema. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, that's not really like provocative though. Like what's the big deal? And like, it's just funny. No, yeah. My uncle's like in his seventies. So it's really funny to like, like see that like that's an Arab thing for you to think like saying a girl is like yeah. like cream is so provocative you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Funny. and then to know that the song was banned that's just that's what I'm saying like it doesn't mean like I think that they make you go against human nature trying to be this person that it doesn't yeah, make true. sense yeah we're actually trying to the artist I manage is coming out with his first solo album actually since you know leaving a duo and one of the what I can say about the new album that's coming out, there's going to be a lot of that. There's going to be a lot of those little things that aren't usually mentioned in Arabic music, and it's going to be in Arabic. So hopefully, let's let's see what the reaction is. I think that a lot of people are going to cancel it too, but that's going to be great. That's what that's our goal. You know what? Cancel us. I mean, that's our goal. <laughs> we have to. We have so like, and that's awesome because, but like, it's good to do stuff like that because there are people yeah. in the Latin world. Oh, and it's going to feature a lot of uh, female artists from the Middle East. That's awesome. That's so cool. It's going to be extra powerful. Um, yeah. I think that it's important to... I think that it's important to, like, express and, and be as you are, like, as long as you're not harming anyone. Um, yeah. And, like, there's so many people in, like, the Latin world that want to, you know, cross over into, like, Arab music and, like, you know, cross genre and do things like that. And I feel like the only way you attract, you know, those types of like forward musicians is if you're being forward as well. So, you know, good luck and God bless you guys. Like I hope it takes, I'm sure that it will take. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll send you, uh, I'll send you it of course, when it's done. Cool. Cool. All right. Anything else you, uh, do you have any guilty pleasures you're uh, watching now or? <laughs> I don't really watch TV if I could be completely honest. TV is mm. like not my, I, my vices are really yeah. just like sugar is a vice. Mm. Um, but like I didn't used to and now I'm more into sugar yeah I'm, which is I'm, not I'm a good thing I guess <laughs> I like go through waves and I'm really just trying to get over it at this point yeah it's it's worse than drugs I feel sugar so addicting yeah they say it's the equivalent of cocaine sugar did you know that is it yeah I, your body's addicted probably you know what probably yeah 
<laughs> your body's addicted no, it's, to uh, sugar. Like that's it. It's it's like being addicted mm-hmm. to cocaine. Like and then getting off of it is very difficult because you know you get a rush when you when you yeah eat sugar or you have it in your coffee. So like mm-hmm. you get off of it and you feel that like lethargic. Like oh, I just want something sweet. It's hard. That's like it, it's an addiction. The problem. So it's it my is. Life. It is. I think isn't it the second after stress? It's the second biggest killer. Worse than cigarettes, is it? Sugar? No, I don't think sugar. Actually, you shouldn't be saying that. You 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 sell cookies. <laughs> Why are we doing this? I mean, in moderation, no, cool. it's okay. In moderation, in moderation, it's, it's yeah. Addiction, it's a problem. And better than your mother's is the most moderate cookie there is. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm saying like a box. No, it's a lot of. You know, yeah. but one box a month, one box every two weeks. It's not a... one box a month. Like mm-hmm. I'm talking about, my sugar problem is like daily. Daily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elf. Tough, tough. <laughs> and I don't eat my own Arabic sweets. Funny enough, like I'll eat like. Don't get high if you're on supply. Exactly. You know what's great That's is that when I first started Better Than Your Mother's, I was dieting, like I was eating really clean, and um, you know, like it's self-discipline, right? Because when you love sugar mm-hmm. and you love sweets, it's just like I'm not eating this, like I can't. And so, like for whatever reason, that stayed like really in my head. And also being in in an environment where you were not allowed to eat what you cook, you can only taste it to make sure. You know, it was going. Oh yeah, that it was, was just imprinted in your mind. Say again. That was just imprinted in your mind, mind. From when so you started. People are like, "How do you stay away from your cookies?" And I was like, "It's actually really easy." But like, ask me if I stay away from sugar in general. That's I wish. No, but I think Especially the, I think that that's going to mm. be the thing now moving forward. Like I, I'm moving towards like you know pescatarian again. I go through waves of like being fit yeah. and like disciplined, and I think I'm going back towards that now. Same. I have till the first of July, and then I have to start being fit again because the gym's open here. I, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so, what is it like yeah. over there with with the pandemic going on? People were so lax. There was more people outside than before <laughs> because everyone is like, "Yeah, oh, no, I'm not gonna be in this house. If you tell me I should be in, stay in this house, I'm gonna go outside." Right. That's the mentality I feel. Um, but uh, then they took more measures when people's cases started rising, and then the government you know, uh, has helped a lot, of course, um, which is something that we're lucky to have. It's not all, most countries don't have that. Yep. So they did really try to support the businesses and small businesses to also stay open and stuff, such, such as myself. So they definitely helped me out too. That's you. Um, That's so awesome. I'm moving to Amsterdam. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come over. Then, uh, but um, yeah, in terms of like now public transports, I'm going to leave later. To go to this Mexican place, um, you have to wear face masks on public transport, and they say that the fines are big. Even if you take it off just to have a drink of water, and you get caught, that's a problem. Which is like, why? Why are you being strict now, and not before? Because before that wasn't the case. There was no face mask in public transport and stuff. Wow, it's strange. It is, but so things are opening up. Honestly, yeah, yeah, and it's it's super hot now, so we're gonna have to have the thing on. I got it right here. Like one of those. <laughs> oh my yeah. surgical ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But cool. I'm uh I saw uh all these these UFC fighters are always uh, very they're craving cookies and they, 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 you really tease them during your promo runs <laughs> mm-hmm. or d- during their fight camps. Yeah. No, I how mean, is not uh, too much teasing? It's like right after they make weight, they get a box. That's like mm, everyone's but then they still have to to fight that the day after and then they can eat or do they do you think they think they wait how many fighters have your cookies helped that have that you think suspect have had your cookies before a fight helped helped in what way as in is it a legal supply like no you you, because you say you give them after after they make weight Mm -hmm. so that means they have them in their possession before the fight right so they'll eat like a cookie because they don't get crazy because they've been cutting so hard like that affects Mm -hmm. The, it'll shock the body and they get uncomfortable. They'll feel sick if they do too much. So they'll have a cookie, yeah. you know, like once they make weight, it's like such a treat. They're so happy. Um, mm. And then after the fight, they go nuts. They'll crush the yeah. So Do you know, do you always keep track of it? Like which, which fighters who've had the cookie of yours end up winning? Compared uh, to the ones that end funny. up losing. Um, well, George, I mean, we, he got his yeah. box. You're close to him. Yeah, he's my favorite. he's my favorite by far. Like he's um, 
I feel you like... You can tell him he's also my favorite. I'll tell him. Really. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a lot of people's favorite. He's just a really good human being overall. Like, I just, mm-hmm. you know, he lives by a code that I really love and, like, his loyalty and just, the, like, his, like... Some people love the limelight. Some people want to be famous. Some And George just mm-hmm. doesn't care for it. Like, he loves his craft and it's just so respectable. Yeah, it seems like it. No, what I like is that, you know, because <clears throat> he disappeared off the radar for a while and... um. I when whenever whenever he speaks of his mindset shift and just that whole like really coming to terms with knowing who you are and how to you know self awareness I'd say is 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 the best way to really become the best at what you do absolutely maybe and that's something he did self awareness is is, since is, then, is important for literally just like life in general everything yeah. not like know what you're good at know what you're bad at. And, and, you know, and, and your strengths as well. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't say any, and like, I think I'm not, I'm never going to take credit for anyone winning a fight. I think that luck is <laughs> a little bit silly. I, I know a lot of uh, people into sports believe in luck, but if you um, think and grow rich is my favorite book. I think I talk about it every time I talk to anybody. Um, and so Napoleon Hill rich. is probably write it down. the founder of, Oh my God, that's a life changer. Seriously. Mm-hmm. So you're welcome in advance. No. Well, thank you. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, but you really got to really gotta read that book. That book is incredible. Um, or listen to it on audio, whatever. Just, just mm-hmm. get that knowledge. Um, he discusses how um, love and superstition is like failure. That, that's, that, that attributes to failure, not yeah. success. Um, so I would love to sit there and say like, oh, I, you know, I'm good luck. But they, they work so hard. And they've trained so hard and they're so talented. Like, that's all them. I'm just No, but so it was their decision to take the cookie. So that's part of the whole strategy. It's not like uh, luck, right? <laughs> Say that again? So it's not, it's not luck because that was actually a decision they made in their strategy to take that cookie. Right, right, right. right. Um, that's what you're saying. But yeah, yeah. no, they, and everyone asks for it after a fight. That's the funniest part. That's the best part. Oh, I'm going I'm to awesome. can I get cookies? So that's, that's yeah. I think my favorite part about, you know, building the brand um, is, is really seeing everyone's favorite part is results, right? It's seeing the success. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it's, um, you know, being able to, you know, go on a set and Nikki Jam gets excited and is like, oh shit, the girl, you know, the cookie girl is here and da da And I don't like being referred to as a cookie girl for, for like the record. Mm-hmm. Um, but like when you're dealing with like mega superstars who have met you three times, you're just, it, it works. It's okay. Yeah. I'll be the cookie girl. <laughs> yeah. So, um, cool. So it's like exciting to like come on a set and everyone will be like, oh, you're here. Yay. You know, like it means like, you know, they're, they're anticipating the product and they know what you're bringing and just that like feeling of excitement and like creating mm-hmm. for your favorite creators or your favorite fighters or your favorite whatever. And them holding you pretty much in that moment in the same regard that you hold them. That's like such a special feeling. Mm. You know? So I think that that's probably my favorite part about building the brand in terms of like any of the guys receiving, um, Receiving the cookies or anything, like I'm never going to take credit for anybody's success. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I can say that they are happy when they get a box. And that they look Is that what motivates you? Sure. Sorry? That, that it... they look forward to it for sure. Oh, yeah. And they intentionally they willingly post about it. Yeah. So is that what... Uh, I don't want to keep you too long, though. I don't know how much time you have, but... Um, yeah. 11, we have like 20 more minutes. All right, it'll be very short. Uh, so yeah, I was gonna ask. So uh, of course, everyone deals with these big slumps in motivation and just ups and downs, and you know it's always difficult to, well, sometimes to to self motivate. Like, what is it that really self motivates you? Gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, keeps you working at building your brand down? Um, that's a complex question. Um. Because I think that it's not just one thing that motivates anyone. I think, um, okay, the question is, what motivates me to get out of my bed in the morning and continue to build the brand, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The fact that I have experiencing it down. The fact that I yeah. have not arrived yet is first and foremost. I want my brand, like yes. my goals or, you know, to be the Louis Vuitton of cookies, so to speak, that I am a luxury 
mainstream item. Like everybody has heard of me and whether you can afford me or not, you do wish to experience what I bring to the table. So the fact that I haven't gotten there yet makes me want to work hard and figure it out. That's one. Two, so there, that's desire, right? So that's desire to be the best. In the, what's the motivated. journey also, maybe. But two, I think that like, um, I want to be like very smart in the way that I answer the question. Like I want to pick my words wisely. Um, I don't think people realize how much control they have over their own mind. And getting into a rut or some place where you're not feeling motivated or whatever mm -hmm. is, you know, a factor of a very few things. One, you've lost desire. So you need to recreate desire in some sort of way. So either you look at something you want to achieve um, and create the desire that way, constantly look at it, remind yourself that you could you can attain that, whatever it may be. Self-discipline has gone out the window. And if, if you, like generally, if you've lost your motivation, it hand in hand, but I would say that like, if you've lost motivation, you know, there's a part of self-discipline that has been lost with it. And, um, I think I already said it, but overall it's really a loss of control of the, like your mind and the way that you think, yeah, mind. because if you're so regimented, so like I'm not saying being all the way one way or another is right or like the right way, but if you're so obsessed and driven, so like they asked LeBron James, when you're going to invest into a company, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. And one of the answers that stuck out to me the most was we look for the obsessive people who are obsessed with their goal. Why is that? Because obsession is rooted in desire. So if yeah. you, essentially, if you understand what motivation is, because motivation, just like success and money is fleeting. If you understand what the root of motivation is, you can, you can easily bring it back to yourself. So yeah. the root of motivation is desire. So when you're no longer motivated, what happened to make you stop wanting your specific goal? Does the goal need to change in a way that it's bigger or better or more suited to what you're doing? Um, and, 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 before, and, and, and I want to say, when you change your goals, it should never be to recalibrate to something smaller. Your goals should change to something only if it's going to fulfill you more and it's bigger and better for you as a person. Mm -hmm. But fulfillment is the first and foremost place because I think that that's what every human like wants the most is to feel fulfilled yeah. to feel like they have a purpose so i think you say how do you stay self-motivated it is they it is a constant like i've listened to think and grow rich i'm an audio person i i much prefer to mm -hmm. listen than to to read it so i've listened to think and grow rich which is a 10-hour book over seven times i've probably listened to it seven and three quarters times and think and grow rich is incredibly yeah. motivational so I listened to someone by the name of Tom Bilyeu, who all he does is bring on people who have the comeback story, who have like, you know, experienced X, Y, and Z in their life. And now they're like at phenomenal levels of success and physical fitness and just everything about their lives is like where you want to be at. So if I don't do that on a regular basis, it's not that I'll lack driver motivation, but there's a clear difference in personality and desire and fire when you're not constantly just listening to that and re re blaming your motivation than when mm -hmm. the person who just doesn't listen to it at all or listens to it once a week or whatever it is. So as I bake, I listen to those kinds of things every time. So it's kind of like, like two things. What keeps you self-motivated? Listening to people who are motivational to me. Mm -hmm. And now I do this thing where, so Napoleon Hill, if you've ever like, did you hear of The Secret or no? The Secret, the book? Yeah, The Secret. Yeah, the, the manif manifestation book. Okay, so The Secret is based yeah. off of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And Bob Proctor talks about that. Bob Proctor was the, the, the author and the full founder of The Secret, okay? Mm -hmm. He discusses how he got all of his theory from Napoleon Hill. And what it is, is you write it down, you visualize it, and you believe that it's yours. 
without ever even having obtained it, right? Yeah. So I've come to realize that, and they say this, Napoleon Hill is like the found, like every motivational speaker is rooted in his teachings. The guy was writing in like the 1920s, okay? This is like super old. Um, yeah, so all this motivational stuff coming out now is basically a root or a byproduct of what he's put out. Exactly. So um, he says, you know, write it down and you have to say it out loud every morning when you wake up and every night before you go to sleep. You should have, a, you should be able to visualize it in your mind. And if you don't, you know, if you need help, you like have pictures all over the place and you should change them mm -hmm. in the order and setting of which they are. So it's, it never gets like mundane in your brain. And what that does is it trains your su subconscious. It trains your subconscious into believing that those things do belong to you. And then it starts delivering the results and the creative ideas to make you go and get them. So not only do mm -hmm. I listen to motive people who motivate me in general, people that I'm like, oh, I aspire to be that way. Like I want that amount of success. I, I now have created a PowerPoint, a slideshow of all the things I ever want in my life. Mm. And I, listen, I, I watch that every morning when I wake up and every night before I go to sleep. And I say out loud, there's certain word, like, like things like, you know, I want to be uh, one of the richest entrepreneurs before in America, the one of the richest people under 40 in America, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm 32 right now. That gives me seven years to make that goal happen. So what they say is like, you, you set the goal, you read it out loud, and your subconscious will then tell you how to get it done. So that's one of the things. So mm -hmm. I, I read that out loud every morning and every night before I go to sleep and multiple times at night. Because before you go, like, that's what people do to brainwash, right? It's like, Hypno it's like awake, hypnosis. And like, they make you look at something or they say things to you or they yeah. do things to you and that's how they mess with your mind. So what I'll do is watch it multiple times over and over and over before I go to sleep, say it out loud over and over and over before I go to sleep and one time before I wake up. And that alone has really recreated this fire and desire inside of me. And that's just something I started like two weeks ago. And I can tell you the results on that are like insane. Yeah. It's it's literally the the 2020 version of doing what Napoleon Hill recommends you do. So I, there's so many ways to stay motivated. I think that what's important is understanding your desires. And if mm -hmm. if you're lacking desire in the goal that you set, then figure out how you need to repurpose the goal to want it again. Yes, I'm gonna. I have to give that a shot too because now you're the third guest in a row that has already. I mean, I sometimes bring it up too, but I always ask about uh, manifestation, and you're the third in a row that brings it up, and that also uses it, lives by it. But I, I must say, you you use it more intensely than the rest, <laughs> intensely like with the visuals as well and everything. Because for the rest, it was more of a like a, a mindset thing, how it resets your brain and keep remembering it, keep visualizing it. And then it sort of becomes your second nature. Right. That you always think about it and are doing everything you can to get there. Right. I really hope it brings uh, you. You'd be an insane case study, right? Right. Right. If, yeah. When no, you get all these goals. No, yeah. But we're, we're, I feel like it's working because, uh, you know, the next few projects, I'm not going to, I can't do like the whole details on them, but. The next projects are really big ones and beautiful ones. And like, I've unfortunately like slacked a little on Instagram, which I strongly recommend slacks, like get a little plan and plan out pictures mm -hmm. 30 days in advance. So that way all you have to do is post some when it's the time to do it. Um, but mm -hmm. I've slacked on social media and because I'm so fully focused on what we're doing next. Um, and then I'm just, it's, it's exciting. So, and I, I think that like this little reel that I created for myself very much helped that. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Thanks. Looking forward to that. Thanks, me too, yeah. Hey, thanks a lot for coming on. This was a brilliant episode. <laughs> thanks for um, having me. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're great. Um, yeah. I just have to ask this. Did uh, George's three-piece and soda come from you? No, that was all himself. <laughs> I would, I, yeah, really? No, that was all him. You know, that was you. Did you see when Leon Edwards, that, that's where that stemmed from. So, okay, I did. Mm. What, what do you are you familiar with what happened in that fight like when he when he had just beaten darren till yeah uh, with uh, the backstage yeah so uh, he, yeah I yeah had, oh that's where it originated from yeah and he was like i had to give him the three piece with the soda 
that was that's all george is hilarious <laughs> yeah it is hilarious so funny honestly i was wondering if you had just ever like made a three-piece and a soda and <laughs> it's like what what came to his mind yeah no no and and no that's just he's just funny and honestly yeah. I, i would tell you like you know a lot of people are like damn i want to be that guy's friend do you want to be that guy's friend he's so awesome he's so cool yeah He's so funny. Yeah, he is my like. I I have friends like that. Right. Those are the best people. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They really are. So no, no, that yeah. wasn't me. I'd love to take credit, but that was all him. All him. Hmm. Oh well. Cool. Okay. Oh. Well. I uh, wish you luck and. Thank you so much. We'll we'll be in touch about the episode. Thank sure. you. I wish you luck as well. Okay. Take care. Anything still you want to share? That any um anything you're promoting extra or is still it's still all under wraps? Yeah, it's under wraps right now. But it's coming. Okay. <laughs> Thank awesome. you so much. Hey, good luck. Hey, have Take a care. great day. Thank you.